a squanderer. Charges were brought to the rich man that this manager was wasting his possessions. A disgraced employee, right? Turn in the account of your management, you're fired. You can no longer be the manager. A schemer. You heard what the man was thinking in his mind. What am I going to do? I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. Ah, I know what I'll do so that when I am removed, when I'm kicked out of my master's house, somebody else will take me in. And it's not too much of a stretch to say that he was a thief, wasn't he? Quick, take your bill and cut it in half. Or you, there, take your bill and lop off 20%. Make it say you only owe 80. Make it say you only owe 50, not 100. And I'll, I'll fix the books on the other end. A praiseworthy man? Jesus says that the master praised that guy. The master praised a wasteful, disgraced, scheming thief. How can that be, right? How can that be? How odd that our Lord would hold up this man as an example to his disciples. And how odd that St. Luke the Evangelist, guided by the Holy Spirit, saw fit to record these words out of everything he could have recorded Jesus saying and doing. St. Luke and the Spirit who spoke through him thought this is important. And how odd that the church throughout history has chosen to read St. Luke chapter 16 verses 1 through 9 on the ninth Sunday after Trinity. Couldn't we read something else? Isn't there someone else who's more praiseworthy than this guy? It's odd, isn't it? It's odd to praise such a steward, a dishonest man, someone who Jesus says is unjust. But it's not impossible It's not impossible, and in fact, usually the things that strike us, the things that stand out to us, are good for us, right? Because if we heard just another example of a good man, it would go in one ear and out the other, and so I think it's great. It's great, isn't it, that Jesus holds up this guy who's very memorable. You've probably known people like this. Jesus holds up this man and this memorable story, this parable about him, for our learning. But why? What is praiseworthy in him. His master praised the dishonest manager for what? Jesus says for his shrewdness, for his shrewdness. And not only does Jesus praise the manager for shrewdness, but he goes on to lament something, doesn't he? He goes on to lament that the sons of this age are more shrewd than the sons of light. That word for shrewdness could also be translated as wisdom. It's the same word that Jesus uses at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Remember the story of the two men who build their houses? One builds on the rock and one builds on the sand. The one who builds on the rock is called a wise man. He is a shrewd man because the rains come down and the floods come up and his house stands. The other guy is foolish. Because he built on the sand, and when the rains fall and the floods rise, that house gets wiped away. This is what Jesus is teaching us this morning, to be wise, to be shrewd. The shrewd choice, or the wise choice, was revealed in the case of the two houses when the rains of life fell and the rivers of life rose. And that Greek word for wisdom is the same one used in the Gospel of Luke. But still, what is so wise about this guy? It's certainly not that he was dishonest. He is not held up as an example for us so that we can learn how to cheat. He is not held up as an example for us so we can learn how to get away with stealing from those who we work for. Everyone, hopefully you realize that is not what Jesus is saying. I want to frame it for you this morning this way. To get you to see the wisdom of this man, I want you to think in terms of fleeting things and permanent ones. Fleeting and permanent, or temper. maybe this is easier, temporary and eternal things. For in your life, there are all kinds of both of those things. You are surrounded, you have, you possess lots of temporary stuff. And you also possess lots of eternal things. The question is, are you wise in handling them? Are you wise? The conundrum 
that, the, that that man had was how to face his final moments as the manager, right? His master said, go get the books. You're fired. Bring the book back to me. And so all that man has is this fleeting, temporary moment where he's still in charge, where he still has possession of the books. He has only the amount of time it takes him to go to his house, get the books, and bring it back to the master. That's all the time he has to figure out what to do to figure out how he's going to turn that temporary awful situation of getting kicked out of the house into something more permanent. And so he finds a solution, doesn't he? He slashes debts, and in so doing, what does he get? He gets a couple of friends, right? Isn't this the way the world works? You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Now, Jesus is not holding this man up as an example for what you should do, but it shows, doesn't it? how one man can take a temporary situation and turn it into a more permanent good. Now think, only think, right, what would have happened if the man, the dishonest man, tried to hold on to his fleeting position. If he had begged his master, please, sir, please forgive me, just give me one more chance. I know I've been an awful manager, but I'm changed now, see? I'm changed, I'm different. I won't do it again. I won't waste your possessions again. If he had begged his master to forgive him, you know how it goes in the workplace. No chance, right? Squanderers are unfit to be managers. Now maybe, right, he could have pled for a demotion, right? Okay, I'm not going to be the manager, but just make me a worker in the field. We're not told much about his character, about the character of the master. Maybe he would have allowed the manager to go on working in the field, but my guess is... My guess is that when your employees disgrace you, you aren't exactly keen on keeping them around. And so a demotion was probably out out of bounds. The man knew his time was up. He knew it was coming to an end. He knew he only had a little bit of time. And that initial recognition, that time was up, that recognition of the fleeting and temporary position that he was in is the first step in being wise. He could have spent his time walking back and reminiscing about his job, right? The good times that he had had as the manager. Maybe all that squandering had proven to be enjoyable for him. He could have filled his time regretting what he had done. Oh, if only I had done things differently. If only I would have been a good employee. If only, if only, if only. It would have been a way for him to preserve those last few moments of being manager. He could live on in his memory. But living on memories won't do, will it? It wouldn't change the master's mind or his situation. He'd be out of a job and out of a home, out on the street, too weak to dig and too proud to beg. And so he had to recognize, he had to come to terms with how temporary his situation was. And recognizing the fleeting nature, recognizing the temporary situation he was in, was the first step. It was the first step in securing something more permanent. After all, the rich man wasn't the only master to work for. There were others. There were other places that he could land. There were other fields, weren't there? The fields weren't for him to work in, and neither were the streets. But if he could just befriend the right person... Well, then he'd have a place to go. Do you see what kind of wisdom Jesus wants to inculcate in you, his disciples? The wisdom and prudence and insight that he wants all of the sons of light, all of his sons and daughters to possess, is the shrewdness to discern the fleeting and temporary nature of this world. Jesus wants you to know the things that last and the things that don't last. He wants you to be grounded in the things that are permanent and eternal and are solid and not be fixed on those things which are temporary and passing away. This is the wisdom that the book of Ecclesiastes is all about. Some of you know how that book starts, right? Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity. But a more literal translation would put it this way. Breath of breath says the preacher. Breath of breath, all is a breath. And the point of the book of Ecclesiastes, some people read it and think this is just depressing, 
right? But the whole point of the book of Ecclesiastes is to help us to realize that life and the things of this world really are like a breath. They're like a vapor passing away on a cold morning. You go outside, you take a breath, and you see it there for a minute, but it quickly fades away. Why try to hold on to that breath? What folly it would be to hold on to a mist, to try to grasp the wind in your hand, as Ecclesiastes say. What folly and ruin it would have been for the manager to try to preserve his place in the master's house. It was over. What wisdom it was for him to turn that fleeting moment into something more secure. Why is it that the sons of this age have deeper insight than the disciples of Jesus? Shouldn't we be the ones who see things more clearly? Of all people, shouldn't we have clarity about the things that are temporary and the things that are permanent? Shouldn't we be able to read and understand the times around us more than those who don't have the Holy Spirit? I think we should. I think Jesus thinks we should, but sadly, I think his words are so true. So often the sons of this age are better at preserving life in this age than we are at pursuing the life of the world to come. It's true that Christians often find themselves, don't we, pulled between the pursuit of temporary things. After all, we have to look after our bodies. We have to take care of our houses. We do have obligations to those around us. And so we are pulled in two directions, the things of this age and the things of the age to come. And those who don't know Christ, well, they don't have that difficulty. They aren't pulled in two directions. They are single-minded in their pursuit of life in this age. But is that really a good thing? Think of a dark cave this morning. Think of, have, have any of you ever been over to Cave in Rock? My kids love going over to that place in southern Illinois. You should go there if you could. When you go into that cave, or any cave for that matter, it takes a while for your eyes to adjust, doesn't it? When you go in there, it takes a while for your pupils to dilate. And at first, you can't really make out the contours of the walls and the floors and the ceiling. But eventually, what happens? Eventually, you get used to the darkness And eventually, you start to be able to see your way through the cave. Now imagine if you kept going in and out of the cave. If you didn't just stay there in the darkness, but you kept going back out into the light to look at the river, and then you went back into the cave, and back into the light, and back into the cave, what would happen? Your eyes would never be able to really adjust. This is the conundrum that we face as sons of light. The sons of this age are like those who live in a dark cave all the time. They don't know the light of Christ. They don't know his grace. They don't know his love. They don't know his call to lead not just a life for temporary things, but to lead the holy life of faith and love. And so they get used to the dark cave. They know the contours and the walls and the ceilings, and they can make their way down in the cave just fine. In fact, some of them are quite good at it, about getting the most out of this age. But as sons of light, you know that there is a world outside the cave. There is a life in the light of Christ and not down in the darkness. And while we're not fully there yet, we know that that is our destination. We know that that is our goal, that that is our home. And so we have a foot in both worlds. We stand on the edge of the cave, so to speak. We have a foot in this age and in the age to come. And because of this, because of this, our eyes have a hard time adjusting. Now, of course, the point is not to say that it would be better to just go into the cave and live in the darkness. You weren't meant to be cavemen and cave women. It would be the, fight of, the height of folly to turn your back on the light so that you can really enjoy life down in the cave. Or to put it back in terms of the temporary and eternal. Think of it this way. You were created and redeemed and sanctified, not just to live for 70 or 80 years in this world. No, you were created by God to pursue eternal life. You were redeemed by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ to live forever. And you are being sanctified now by the Holy Spirit to live not just this life, but to live the life of the world to come with Christ and with all his saints. 
And so Jesus tells you to get, what, to get wisdom, to become wise about things, to recognize the fleeting nature of the things of this world and the eternal nature of the things of the world to come. Pray. Pray that the Lord would increase in you wisdom and shrewdness so that you could be able to discern things. Isn't this how Jesus ends up speaking? Use your unrighteous wealth, your mammon, your fleeting stuff, your money, your possessions, your jobs, your influence. Use it to befriend those who have eternal homes. Why? Why shouldn't we just store up wealth for ourselves? Why shouldn't we suck up as much as we can? Because it will fail you. Wealth, physical health, mental abilities, possessions, income, clothing, cars, bodily pleasures, honors, and recognitions, they're all temporary, like the manager's job in the rich man's house. But the people that God has put into your life are eternal. Every person who you encounter, everyone you look around in this room at today is not just a temporary mist, a vapor floating through the world and quickly fading away. So is Jesus saying you can buy your way into heaven? Is Jesus saying that somehow you can put God into your debt? Or that if you befriend enough Christians, or just the right ones anyways, that somehow they'll sneak you in through heaven's back door or they'll open the basement window of heaven and say, hey, come in this way. Hopefully you see how silly that is. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And you know that wonderful passage in Ephesians that says, by grace you have been saved through faith. So what does Jesus mean about making friends who will receive you into the eternal dwellings? Well, only remember that heaven is not a solitary, isolated place. That the heavenly mansion of our Father will be full. And guess what? There will be people who you recognize when you get there. And there will be people who recognize you when they get there. In fact, there will be people in this room who will be there when you arrive. And how do you want them to receive you? Do you want them to look at you when you come into heaven and say, Oh, I don't want to talk to her. I don't want to have anything to do with him. Or do you want them to receive you? Hopefully you've all had the experience of coming home after a long day's work and hearing someone say, welcome home, I've been waiting for you. Hopefully you've had that experience coming into church on Sunday morning of people saying, hey, it's good to see you. That feels good, doesn't it? How much better, how much better will it be when we get to heaven and the saints who we have known and loved in this world look at us and say, we've been waiting, welcome home. Put temporary things in service of the eternal. This is one of the reasons that we give our offerings, isn't it? That we serve our time and our talents in the church. Because in this way, our temporary lives serve to befriend those who will receive us in eternity. In this way, we put our temporary stuff into the mission of the gospel. And just so we participate in the great mission of the Holy Spirit. Can you see that picture? Can you see entering the Father's mansion and being greeted by your friends whom you have loved and served here on earth? Can you imagine your children, your parents, your fellow members from St. Paul saying to you, welcome home, how we love you. Thank you for all of the time. Thank you for all of the energy. Thank you for all of the love that you showed me there on earth. If you've loved being received at home at the end of a hard day's work, if you have known the joy of being welcomed by your friends, imagine how much greater it will be when we reach not just our temporary dwelling, but when we come to our eternal home. What sacrifice would you not make now to be received then? And because this is so, we should put every effort into putting all that temporary stuff into the service of the eternal. So be wise, you sons of light. Be shrewd in the management of the Father's gifts that he has entrusted to you here and now. Be faithful in the little that you have now. For true riches, the real stuff, lies ahead of you. Don't don't hoard up the fleeting things here. Don't hoard up your time and your talents and your energy. For you have friends that need your love. You have friends that need your help. And you have friends who will receive you who will dwell with you forever. So strive, 
strive to put one another in debt. Put one another in debt, not of money, but put one another in the great debt of love, which does not breed resentment or bitterness, but wells up in thanksgiving and praise and love in return. To Christ be all glory now and forever. Amen.